Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things I did. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still lives and will be through it all. So come on, may in the space between and all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Between us, 
That's beautiful. Good morning, Foothill. It's another, it's another Sunday morning. Hey, good morning, those who are watching at home. We know there's a lot of you who watch at home, and we appreciate you. Um, hey, would you all stand up and uh, gather with us in worship? Let's, let's worship Jesus, dude. Let's go. Sing it out. So when I find I'll fight on my knees with my hands it did I oh God the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I see through the night oh God the battle belongs to you if you are for me and if you are for me, who can be against me? Yeah. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. And all I see are the ashes. You see the beauty. Oh, God, that'll be long. 
before us nothing can stand against the power of our God sing it out you shine in the shadow you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that don't belong to you. belongs to you. Yeah. Oh God, that all belongs to you. Yeah. Praise the Lord, dude. Good morning, everyone. You can sit down for a moment if you like. Good to see all your smiling faces this morning. And we have a few announcements for you. Tonight, 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 tonight is tonight. I don't know. No. <laughs> Tonight's our fall festival. And so if you haven't signed up already to uh, park your car and hand out candy out of your trunk, then uh, and decorate your trunk and, and make the kids feel welcome as they come and, and get candy, um, we still need people to sign up for that. Um, and we're going to start setting up today at noon. Um, and so if you can come back and help us, if you can't be here tonight, but you can come and help us set up at noon, that would be great. Or if you can't come at noon, then come tonight and help us. But the best thing would be if you could come at noon and stay all the time and <laughs> help us all the way. We're going to go from four to seven tonight, and it's just going to be a great, a great time, so you don't want to miss it. Then this Wednesday is the senior luncheon at noon in the social hall. We're asking you to bring a salad or a dessert to share, and uh, we'll provide the rest. And please, if you're not feeling well, stay home. Um, and pray for those that are there. Um, our next men's breakfast is this Saturday at 8 a.m. in the social hall. Join us for some great food, bacon, um, fellowship with bacon, and worship with bacon um, with your brothers in Christ. And if you have any questions, you can see Robert Friesen about that. And then this coming Saturday also is the end of daylight savings time. So next Sunday, we will fall back. Fall back. That means your clocks go back um, an hour. And so uh, we'll remind you again, probably on Facebook and on the, because someone fall back. Let's see, this year, if you don't set your clocks, then you get to church an hour early, right? Yep. Yeah. So we won't remind any of you. So we'll just see you early for worship practice next Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> and then our sowers ministry will meet again um, Thursday, November 11th. That's uh, two weeks from this last Thursday. We'll be meeting at 9 a.m. in the social hall. So there's plenty of things to do. If you uh, have any questions, you can see Diane Schweitzer, Peggy Merritt, or Kathy Wilcox, and they'll give you a blanket to do or some crochet, whatever, you, whatever they need done, and it goes to great causes. So you might want to get involved with that. And then lastly, on Saturday, November 13th, we'll be having our first hymn sing here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. And you don't want to miss that. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful time singing those, the hymns. I was going to say the old hymns, but... All of hymns are great to sing. So, um, so, that, so mark your calendars for November 13th at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary for a wonderful time of singing some uh, hymns together. And there will be a reception to follow in the social hall. And if you have any questions, you can ask Nancy Pierce, and she'll tell you all about it. And we'll sing some great songs that night. I'm looking forward to that night. So that's all I have for you. So let's stand up and meet and greet your neighbors around you. Say hello. Maybe there's someone you haven't seen in a while, and you just want to... Make them feel welcome this morning, and then we'll get back into worship.
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall For you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. Oh, my heart will sing your praise again. still stands. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail. Sing it out. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail me.
Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. seated for communion. thought about communion this morning, uh, I actually thought about an old hymn uh, that was written in 1865 by Albina Hall, and it's really a, it's really a, a neat story because she was sitting in church one Sunday morning, and she really wasn't paying attention to what the pastor was saying during his message, and the pastor could tell that she was just kind of in la-la land doodling notes on her bulletin. And afterwards, he, he confronted her and said, so how was my sermon? And she said, well, frankly, Pastor, I, I really wasn't paying attention <laughs> this morning. She goes, because thoughts just kept running through my mind. And she goes, I, I jotted down these words. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, Watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. And then she continued to write, Lord, now indeed I find that thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt this heart of stone. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. And when before the throne I stand in his complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall then repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson, but he washed it white as snow. As we take our time our quiet time this morning to reflect on what Jesus did for us. Just remember that as we partake of the, the emblem of his body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for the redemption of our sins, that he did that for you. And I always like to say it, if you had been the only one, I believe he still would have done it just for you because he's your savior and he loves you that much. Father, we thank you this morning that we have this opportunity to just pause, take a breath and do this in remembrance of you. Father, as we partake of the emblem of your broken body this morning, 
let us be reminded that through your stripes we are healed. Let us be reminded that through the shedding of your blood, our sins are covered. Just like the song said, our sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed it white as snow. And for that, we are so thankful this morning. We love you. In your name we pray. Good morning. If you haven't already heard, the reason the doors are open is that the baptistry was resurfaced this last week, late in the week. And so when we walked in yesterday, we're like, those fumes are pretty strong. So uh, we needed to make sure that the, the doors were open and there was some, some circulation going through. So if you get a little headachey, just raise your hand and we'll drop the oxygen out of the, the <laughs> air there. If it doesn't inflate, don't worry, there will be a flow of oxygen coming through. Hey, happy birthday to Damian Brown back on the first. Mary McKenna had a birthday as well on the first. Bonnie Ruiz also on the first. That was a busy day. Bonnie, happy birthday to you, young lady. Over there, uh, Kristen Allen was on the fourth. Connie Mendoza, right there. Connie Mendoza, the 10th. Uh, uh, James McDowell was on the 14th. Be praying for the McDowell family, would you? Uh, be praying for them. Merlene, too. Merlene, I know you're watching. This is probably not a secret, but uh, she got COVID, so pray for her. You get rid of that. Uh, Dana Kiss on the 14th. Steve Palath on the 14th. Uh, Nancy Dirks was on the 16th. Happy birthday, Nancy. Uh, Valer Watson was the 18th. The twins, Olivia and Lincoln, they, they celebrated on the 23rd. Uh, oh, man. Uh, Gail, Gail Taylor on the 23rd as well. Uh, Joshua Albright on the 24th. Mike Rokita, we, we celebrated last week. Larry, Larry Allen, are you here? Did I see Larry? No? Larry Allen, he's probably celebrating his birthday. It was yesterday. Okay? And then uh, shout out for Barbara Costello has her birthday on Halloween Day. Celebrating today. Happy birthday to all you who celebrated your birthday this month. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear all of you. Happy birthday to you. Always good to celebrate those things, uh, and happy birthday. A uh, couple more announcements that I want to tackle before we get into uh, the word today. I, I want to talk to you about um, something that's happening in the, in the community park on the 14th. 
uh, two weeks from today. It's going to be at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's going to be, did I say at the community park? Where the amphitheater is, behind it, and we'll be facing the parking lot there. There's lots, a big grass field, lots of people picnicking, so we'll be, we'll be um, teaching the gospel in song and scripture with um, the, the churches of the Yucaipa Valley Ministerial Association, and so that'll be at 4 o'clock. We'd love to have you come and, and celebrate we're still thankful in spite of all that's happened in the world over the last two years or so. We're still thankful for what God has done, and we want to celebrate that outdoors under the big canopy that God has created for us. And then um, the Thanksgiving situation with um, Green Valley Christian Church is coming up really quick. There are three things that I want you to know about that. On the 14th, yeah, the same day as still thankful. On the 14th, right after church um, at noon, so a couple, an hour or so after church gets out, um, we're going to meet over at Green Valley, and we're going to fill um, 100 boxes. We're going to be giving 100 turkey boxes away um, to, to families in the community on the 16th. But on the 14th, we'd love all of you to come over to Green Valley and help us get those boxes together. Combining with three churches, Green Valley, Retreat Church, and us will get together and pack the boxes at noon on the 14th. And then on the 16th, at 12 o'clock, we're going to give those boxes away. And so in the sanctuary over there, uh, more than 100 people are going to come. They don't know this yet, but that's a captive audience. We're going to teach them the gospel while they're waiting for their turkey. Okay, so that's my favorite part of that week. Um, so that's the 16th at, at noon, noon to 2. If you want to come and help us at 10 o'clock, you can do that as well. And then on the 20th, on the 20th, we're going to do a big community um, Thanksgiving dinner over there at Green Valley. Everybody's invited. You can come eat. Invite those that may, maybe, maybe don't have a home. Um, come invite them to, uh, to, to turkey dinner with us, and that'll be a way of us to celebrate Thanksgiving with other churches and, and let the community know that we're willing to work together. That's something revolutionary. I love that, and I'm so glad that we get to be a part of it. There's sign-up sheets in the back, at the back table there. Make sure you go back there and sign up. You can cook a turkey if you want for that event. There's some, some things that you can get involved with. Um, if, you, if you have any questions about that, you can see me. Um, you can talk to Debbie Baldwin, or you can hook up with Gary, and he'll give you all the information that you need on that. Okay? Gary, did I cover everything? Is that good? All right, good. Thumbs up. Do you remember, do you remember a simpler time? Do you remember a simpler time? Maybe, maybe for, for my generation, we watched television, television shows like The Facts of Life and uh, Family Ties. Uh, it, it, they were shows that in 22 minutes, in 22 minutes, a story would be presented that, that, that had a problem, and it was solved in the context of the culture of, of the day. Anybody remember Alex P. Keaton? Okay, Michael J. Fox's character on that, on that show. He, he, he would solve all the world's problems before the end credits rolled, right? And, and in Facts of Life, Mrs. Garrett at the, at the boarding school there would teach the girls all about the ways of the world, all the different dimensions of life in, in, that, in that time. With humor and perspective, we could understand, we kind of knew that things were going to be okay because people had the answers, and those answers were Quite, quite simple, quite easy. For some of you in the older generation, shows like maybe Leave It to Beaver. Okay, am I, am I, hitting, am I hitting too close to home? Father Knows Best, Father Knows Best is on the list. Yep, that's next. Uh, another one? My Three Sons, uh, Gidget, and, and a perennial favorite, I Love Lucy. Beverly Hillbillies helped us understand how to navigate difficult times. Hogan's Heroes helped contextualize the, 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 the realities of, of war and peace. Even the Flintstones, even the Flintstones help us to learn great lessons about how to treat one another. It was a simpler time. It was an easier time. The reality is, though, that, that we're living in quite a different world now, aren't we? Maybe a different world than just one generation ago. Certainly much different than two or three generations ago. It's, it's difficult these days to, to watch a movie or even a TV show without seeing how quickly and how dramatically the culture has changed right in front of our eyes. We're in a series right now called Reset. We're acknowledging that it's time to hit the reset button 
on, on how the church operates and how it ministers to the community in a world where, quite frankly, Jesus isn't even wanted anymore. I love that we open the doors and they can kind of hear us. They've been hearing us at 7.30 this morning. <laughs> right, like, good night, good night. In some cases, churches in America, churches in America are already at a point where, where they can no longer effectively minister to or even meet the needs of, of the, the community that they are a part of now. And, and this week, as we look at chapter 6 and 7 in, in the book of Acts, we get, to ask, we get to ask some really pretty dangerous questions. The main character we're looking at today is a man named Stephen. How many of you have heard of Stephen? Okay. He became, he became the first Christian martyr. But before we dive into this story, here are a couple of the questions, those dangerous questions that we need to ask this morning. Are, are you willing to die? Are you willing to die for the gospel? That's a dangerous question. Here's another one. Are we willing to lay our lives down for the church? Are, are we willing to stand for Jesus in a world that in some cases now considers him an enemy? I, I think we know the answers to those questions, but, but let's look at the story. If you haven't already opened your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 6. Okay, this reset, reset series is taking us all the way through the book of Acts. We're going to get through about chapter 9 before Thanksgiving hits, and then after the first of the year, we're going to pick up the rest of the, of the book and study all the way up through Easter and perhaps beyond. But this is the story of Stephen. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, says this, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay? So think in, think in terms of, of a 22-minute sitcom here. Okay? We've got a problem. There's a situation that we need to solve. Verse 2. So the 12, capital T, 12, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. See how even in the early church there started to be some delegation of some of the, the, the things that were happening in the church. There were certain functions that were starting to appear. Verse 5 says, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. I'm going to say Timon because of Lion King, sorry. <laughs> Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Okay, we do that. Elders, elders lay their hands on ministers as they're ordained. Um, those things happen in the life of the church. Seven. So the word of God spread. What did it do? It spread. What did it do? It spread because the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. See what happened? There wasn't a reset button right here. They were establishing the order of the church. They were established, establishing different ministries of the church. There had been a problem with, with this new church-led culture that was developing, though. There, there were different ministries that were developing in the growing church. The Word of God, the Word of God absolutely needed to be preached, but feeding people was something that needed to be handled as well. Having, having grown up in the Salvation Army, I remember times when, even in the middle of the Sunday morning worship, somebody would knock on the door and they would need food or lodging or some kind of care. And I remember my parents were among some of those people who would get up in the service and leave and take care of those people. 
It wasn't wait till after the service or, you know. In some cases, it was sit here and listen to what we're doing, and then we'll do it afterwards. But most of the time, it was get out and take care of the need immediately, that quickly. A similar thing was happening here in, in the early church. The church was more, it was more than just about spreading the message of, of who Jesus was. There, there was an understanding that widows needed to be fed. There were things that needed to be done. So the church developed a system where, where people would preach the gospels and gospel and other people would take care of those needs. This, this is now where we meet Stephen. Okay? He was, uh, he was one of these original seven guys on, on the committee tasked with handling this work. This is Stephen's story. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Oh, man. Look at verse 9. Opposition arose. Really? Like right off the bat? Really? From the very start? Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. In the church. Arguments in the church. Imagine that. Verse 10. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Ah, maybe the Holy Spirit's behind the reset button. It's amazing to see. It's amazing to see what, what is happening here. Sure. There were already factions in the church. There had already been growing factions all over the place. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were complicating. Well, they were complaining too. But they were com they're complicating the spreading of the gospel. The very men who should be forwarding it were complicating that work. And the Sanhedrin, that group of leaders, uh, they, they've already been in play here in this book of Acts. They're kind of the, the fun police or, or the cancel culture of their day. They're the, they're the ones who are waiting for you to mess up so that they can get right in your face and say, ah! You think cancel culture is tough now. Just watch this. Look at verse 11. Then they secret, oh, secretly, oh, man. Secretly, Really? They secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses in the church. False witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have, heard him, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Something had changed. His appearance had changed. His countenance had changed. At the end of chapter 6, the battle lines were being drawn. See, Jesus, Jesus had already paid the ultimate price to teach the people about his, his father. And now, and now the church was spreading like crazy, and members of the priesthood were turning toward the way. The priests were joining the way, Jesus. The influence of the apostles was, was growing. The Pharisees had already disrupted the work of Jesus, and they weren't about to let their foot off the pedal. They wanted to continue that work of disrupting. And there's some difficult things like that, that that happen in the church today. Denominations are splitting over matters of, of sin and of culture. Some churches are skewing to the left, allowing slowly to, for, for sin to, to normalize. Compromises are being made away from the, the faithfulness to scripture and biblical principles and moving, moving ever so slowly, sometimes not slowly, toward more secular cultural norms. 
Some churches, though, some churches swing the other way, and they're, they're holding on so tightly to a legalistic view, a pharisaical view of, of the church and of Scripture that, that they've lost the ability to reach the very people we've been placed in the community to reach. Do you understand that? There's, there's those two things that are happening in our culture today. These weird things that we, we consider really sad that were happening in the first century church are, are manifesting themselves in the world today. When our, churches, when our churches become museums for saints, when, when our churches fail to be welcoming to sinners and lost people and those who struggle, we lose our ability to share the gospel with the very people we have been tasked to reach. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys understand all of that. But we need to be reminded of that so that we don't slip either way. So that we stay on that narrow path that Jesus created for us to walk. And I know it's tough. Look, if, if those people if those people show up, the, the, church, the church might not be safe anymore. It, it, they might stink. You know, I... You know, I've, I know you've heard me talk over the years about how um, my dad had tomatoes thrown at him while preaching the gospel in the streets. As a young man, I saw that on, on a couple of occasions. You think that's not real. It's quite real. I've seen, I've seen dumpsters set on fire behind the church building. And, and those homeless people who come into the church and they, they just, they, they stink so badly. Here's the reminder. You stink sometimes. Yeah. And I stink sometimes. Just, just ask my kid. <laughs> so many stories. Boy, if I could just turn back time. Our, our, our self-righteousness stinks. Our sanctimoniousness stinks. Our arrogance stinks. And all I want you to hear in this story is that the same things that are happening now were happening then. And then Stephen stood up. Stephen stood up. He had been, he'd been accused of, of blasphemy, the, the Sanhedrin. They wanted him to answer for his crimes. They even brought false witnesses and presented false accusations. But then, but then it happened. Then it happened. God showed up. God showed up on the scene. The Holy Spirit got to work. Stephen's face changed. It looks like the face of an angel. And I can imagine that now Stephen had a captive audience. For just a moment, he had a captive audience. Look, I pray all the time that the Spirit would help me to illuminate stories through, through our messages here. What, what if my face lit up like that? What if, what if Eric's face lit up when he was teaching the gospel here? What would, what would happen? I get a sense that you'd probably pay more attention. I know I would. I know that I would, and, and I'd be willing to bet that you would invite your, if that, if that happened, you would invite your friends and say, dude, this guy's face lights up when he teaches. Like, literally, you've got to come and see this. That was happening. That was happening in that moment. The, the, the gospel had become attractive. The Spirit of God was at work, and it became attractive, and the, the kingdom was growing, and it was happening. I want you to go back. I want you to go back and read Stephen, Stephen's sermon today. Maybe not today. You need to be here with me all day. Maybe we'll take a break and we'll read it. 
at 3 o'clock, we'll just take a quick break and read through the, the thing here. <laughs> I, I wish we had time to read it, but he very carefully, Stephen very carefully and succinctly goes back and lays out his case. Like a skilled defense attorney, he tells them right to their face what he had been preaching. He talked about the history of God's people, how, how, how God used Abraham to build a family, how, how they would be treated, how they would grumble and complain, and how God would still be faithful to them as, as father through all of that. He talks about the next two generations that would lead a people. Stephen tells the story of, of, of Joseph and how God would use him to provide, not just for a king and the king's court, but for an entire country, for an entire nation, for that corner of, of the world. He would save them from famine. And he tells them the story of Moses and how God would lead that man to lead the people, to instruct them on how to follow God and how to love God, how to follow his laws and, 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 and how to do it in love. Moses, who was a murderer, uh, 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 an insecure, study, stutter, stuttering communicator, I didn't mean to stutter there, was, was ordained to be the one that would lead God's people. This is what Stephen is telling them. Check this out. In verse 30 there, in, in chapter 7, Stephen reminds them how God revealed himself to Moses. He did it in a burning bush. And the reminder came that, 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 that Moses didn't need to fear he didn't even fear what was going on. Fearing God was enough in that moment. God himself was going to take care of them. Why did, Stephen, why did Stephen need to tell him this in the first place? See, the Sanhedrin was made up of smart guys. They, they knew the Torah. All of them did. They knew what God had done. The supreme council of, of, of Jewish men were well versed in, in these stories. But they needed a reminder. They needed to see the glory of God on Stephen's face. So was it enough? Nope. After all, after all of that systematic theology, showing them, walking them step by step who God was and what he had done, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Because he reminded them in verse 40 that, that God's people had made a habit of turning away from him. <laughs> they turned to Aaron. His people had turned to Aaron to make an idol. Moses hadn't even come down off the mountain before they had turned away. And it got worse. They started worshiping other gods, creating idols. It was all the stuff that was happening in Stephen's time. It's happening here. It's happening now all over again. It's the stuff that people of today are doing. They're, they're worshiping other gods, and they're, they are creating other idols, and they are serving other idols. But here, Stephen goes on to point out that Joshua, from Joshua to David and Solomon, the people of God enjoyed the blessings. They enjoyed the blessings and the protection that God generously offered to them. And even through all of that, even through all of that, Stephen's closing arguments include the, the fact that God, he'd never even settled into a, a permanent place, a temple. And the sad part of it all was that by this time, the temple of that day had become so legalistic, so, so driven by politics and greed and selfish ambition, that Jesus created a new, ex, new expression of the body of Christ. As important as the temple was, It, be, it became more important to meet in churches and in homes and in communities because that's, that was the truth that he wanted them to know. Now the temple of the living God is wherever you are. Know ye not, know ye not, you are the temple of the living God. That's who you are. Jesus had come to, to do the ultimate reset on the church. He tore the veil in the temple, and, and he was now setting the church in the hearts of men, and the cell church was born, meeting in homes and communities. No longer was it a place where only the high priest could go. It was the church, it was the temple, and it was in the hearts of men. And quite frankly, that ticked off the religious leaders. It made them mad. 
And there were so, there's some reasons. If we had more time, we'd, we'd go through those, list, th- those, those reasons why. But, but right now, right now, I want you to listen. Listen to Stephen's final words. If you've never read the story of Stephen, this is, this is a treat. This is what he says. You stiff-necked people. Okay, just remember, remember, as he's saying this, he has, he has the face of an angel. He's glowing. The, the glory of God is literally shining on Stephen's face. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. That, that should right there, that should have been, right? You know where we're going with this? I'm not going to drop it because it doesn't belong to us. That's a mic drop moment right there, right? He told them what they needed to hear, and he should have just dropped the mic and walked off stage. That should have been the moment when the Sanhedrin said, you know what? You're right. You're right. Thank you for the reminder. Let's, let's hit the reset button. Let's try it again. But you know this story better than that. You know the story better than that. Those people Stephen stood before were self-serving and they were selfish. They were power hungry and abusive. And sadly, there are places today that we can see that in the modern church. There are self-serving leaders. There are churches compromising the gospel. And truth be told, even church leaders are struggling. We talk about this all the time. You know, we're caught in the middle of conversations about mask and no mask. Do I vaccinate or do I not vaccinate? What do I do about critical race theory? What do I do about the apostasy that's happening in the church right now? That's just a big word for people who followed Jesus one moment and they said, no, thank you, the next moment. That's happening all over the church and all over the world. These are the problems and the issues that are playing out in the church in real time today. But even in the middle of Stephen's message, those things fall on deaf ears. And what did we expect? What did we expect? He called them stiff-necked. He called them uncircumcised. He called them resistant to the spirit. He called them murderers. It's not like they're going to go, okay, you're right. You know, smack the head. No, that's not what was going to happen here. They weren't having any of that. And the moment came to do something about it. Verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw, <clears throat> saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears. Yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were... Oh, you want to talk about grace? You want to talk about mercy this morning? You want to talk about reset, what it looks like for us? Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees. Get this one. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Sound familiar? Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, He fell asleep. Stephen was faithful to the end. Absolutely faithful to the end. Now we don't we don't know much about him and how he how he was selected for for this committee, but we what we do know. 
what we do know should inform us on how we stand in these tough times. Remember those dangerous questions we talked about earlier? Here they are. Will, will we be known? Now, not personal enough. Will you be known as a person who was faithful to the end? Will, will you be a person who's prepared to tell the story of what Jesus did for you? S Stephen stood with that history lesson as a way of saying, look what God did for me. Look what God did for my people, and as an extension, what he did for all of us. Stephen painted a brilliant picture of how faithful God was to his people from the very beginning right up to that point. <laughs> we spent the summer looking at all of those guys that he talked about and what it looked like to stand, to stand, to stand in the middle of the kinds of trials that each one of them faced. And if we all, if you all look back on your lives, you know that there's, there's moments that defined what God did for you. Whether it was radical conversion, I was once this way and now I am this way. There's something in your life that marks what God did for you. Maybe you're one of those people that said, thank God I never had to deal with that. My parents brought me to the church from the womb and I never left. Maybe that's your story. And, and I'm looking forward to being able to look back at this time, <laughs> this time in our history, and remember how faithful God was to us in these moments. But here's the question we want to ask this morning. This is the main, the main question. In light, in light of a series called Reset, what does Stephen teach us about resetting because i know that it's really important to know your story stephen did what peter ends up reminding us in his letter first peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 but in your hearts revere christ as lord always be prepared always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Kind of wish the Sanhedrin might have woken up to that. But are you ready to tell your story like Stephen did? Even, even when you're accused of speaking blasphemously? Even when, people, even when people don't want to hear it, even if you face stoning for it. Because if you look around, if you look around at what is happening in the world today, it is getting more and more difficult to stand for the word of God. I'm not lying. So you might be too afraid to speak out on that one. But amen's the proper word right there because that affirms, let it be so. Let it be so. Remember, amen means let it be so. That's what we're up against. Let's, let's embrace it. You and me, the church, need to be ready to stand and tell the truth because there will be those moments when, like the people of the Sanhedrin, they're going to go, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want it. Reset for the modern church. Is, it looks like speaking the truth like never before. And there is, a, there is such a beauty to Stephen's story. Even, even in the middle of the stoning, he saw Jesus. Even in the middle of the stoning, he spoke, he spoke forgiveness over those who were killing him. Don't hold him... Don't hold it against them, is what he said. Will we have that kind of grace and mercy? Will we have the kind of forgiveness? Will we have the kind of forgiveness to let each other off the hook? When I mess up, are you going to let me off the hook? When your brother or sister stumbles, are, are you going to mock them? Are you going to leave them there? Are you going to stand them up, dust them off, and say, Jesus died, so you'll be okay?
There are those in the world who want to stamp out the message of the gospel. And we make it easier when we don't do the things that Jesus called us to do. Is there a reward for that kind of courage? Well, when Jesus looked up, he saw, even on this earth, what he was about to gain as his eternal prize. And this morning, I hope that's us. I pray, I pray that that is us. Because I know that if it is, we will have done what God called us to do. To be faithful to the end. Right to the end. Would you pray with me this morning? God, I, I know we want to be the people who, who whose, whose, face, whose faces literally shine so that other people can see. And we know that, that you probably won't light us up like you lit up Stephen. But through your Holy Spirit, we ask that, that you would that you would brighten our hearts, that you would brighten our countenances, that people would see the joy of your son Jesus on our faces and say, what is different? What is it about you? Thank you for the faithfulness of Stephen. Thank you for the way that his story shows us how we can live, how we can be faithful to the end, how we can tell our story and point to your story so that every person we come in contact would know the grace and mercy extended to us by a loving Savior. God, help us to reset. Help us to learn one more time, afresh, anew, what it is to fully serve you, to be fully surrendered to you, even in the face of a stoning, even in the face of the criticism that this culture lodges against us. Help us to be faithful, faithful, faithful to the end. God, hear the cry of your, the hearts of your people this morning. with us this morning. so much for this morning, God. We want to thank you for, for Stephen and his powerful message, Lord. We just pray that we, we reset our minds, Lord, that we open our minds um, to your truth, your, your, your gospel, Lord, that we just remember that we stink sometimes, Lord, but, um, but it's 
but, but again, you died for us, and we have that power of you in us, Lord. You tabernacled your way into our hearts, God. We are your temple. We are your people. Lord, we love you. May we live like that. Lord, may we be your church, your people, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You all have a fantastic week.